As soon as Christopher Columbus touched solid ground, the race was on. Conquistadors set sail from Europe to claim the newly discovered Americas in the name of glory, gold, and God, though some of those priorities ranked above others to monarchs in need of cash. The crafty King Ferdinand of Spain, a statesman whose subtlety had once inspired Machiavelli, dispensed with all pretenses in 1511 when he commanded his conquistadors, get gold, humanely if possible, but at all hazards, get gold. Unfortunately for the royal budget, the conquistadors' dreams of El Dorado were disappointed. The huge piles of Inca and Aztec gold they found had been the accumulation of centuries, not the annual intake. Once that was looted, the supplies dried up and could not be replaced even by the conquistadors' most assiduous pillaging of tombs. Despite their diligent depredations, the Spanish colonies of Mexico and Peru, encompassing much of the land area of the New World, became a net financial loss-maker to the Spanish crown early on. As the flow of spoils dwindled, conquistadors sought a more sustainable source. The gold mines they located were small, and for the most part produced very little. But in the 1520s, in the mountains of southwest and central Mexico, the expeditions of Hernan Cortez had found a consolation prize, massive veins of silver ore. The Aztecs and the peoples before them had known about most of the silver deposits, but their mining had been relatively small scale, and the vast majority of the ores were still there for the taking. Now the conquistadors set to work. Putting down their weapons, they took up hammers and gads and started mining silver. There was only one problem. They had no clue what they were doing. Having been selected for military rather than mining ability, they had little understanding of extraction methods, and their behavior had left the local people rather disinclined to help. The 90-meter-long tunnel in the Tosco silver mine had to be dug by the hands of Cortez's men themselves, along with whomever they could catch and press into service. They imitated Aztec mining methods, not too expertly. Their mines collapsed and or flooded on a regular basis, smelting was inefficient, and outputs were low. But the Spanish government sent it opportunity. In 1536, a team of experts from the silver mines of Germany was imported into Mexico, and the normally tight-fisted king of Spain splurged on mining infrastructure. Water wheels and drainage tunnels took care of the flooding problems, and high-volume processing methods such as stamp milling were introduced. New smelting techniques and furnaces vastly increased output, and shafts began to reach hundreds of yards deep. Pretty soon, Mexican silver production was booming, and Cortez the Conquistador had become a mining entrepreneur. But Mexico would be the reigning jewel in the Spanish crown for only a few years. To the south, the Incas had long known that a certain conical hill was home to vast deposits of rich silver ores. They had called it Potosi, after a Quechua word meaning hill of great noise, when a thunderstorm thought to be divinely inspired had stopped their mining efforts. In 1545, its silver became known to Francisco Pizarro and his Spanish conquistadors, who pounced on what they called Cerro Rico, or Rich Hill. To begin mining and smelting ores, they conscripted native laborers, a process facilitated by Pizarro's son, who had personally assassinated a crown official opposed to enslavement. Seeing the success in Mexico, the Spanish government considered finding another set of German experts to send to Peru, but local innovation preempted them and made what had been the new smelting technology obsolete. In 1554, a Mexican merchant named Bartolomé de Medina invented a new process for extracting the silver from the ores, which were mostly acanthite, a silver sulfide, and similar minerals. Medina's process was based on the earlier Roman technique of mercury amalgamation, where crushed ores were mixed with mercury that dissolved the silver. Boiling off the mercury then left the pure silver behind, and ideally the mercury would be condensed back down and reused. This technique had not worked on the silver sulfides, which, unlike other silver ores, failed to dissolve in the mercury. Medina added a few more ingredients to help the dissolution along. 
instead of just plain mercury. The ores were dumped out on a paved patio and mixed with a cocktail of mercury, salt, water, and an ingredient called magistral, which consisted of weathered copper and iron sulfide minerals. After a few days of being continuously mixed, the acanthite would react with the salt and copper, losing its sulfide and converting to a silver chloride. Unlike silver sulfide, silver chloride does dissolve in mercury, and so the mercury collected from the patio after a couple of weeks was laden with silver, and boiling it off in a retort would leave pure silver behind. Medina's technique was an instant hit across the Spanish colonies. It could recover just as much metal as the smelting furnaces of the time, typically two-thirds to three-quarters of what had been in the ore. Better yet, it required no charcoal or other fuel, always a major limitation, especially in the arid lands around Potosí. It took fewer workers to produce more silver. And so, from Mexico to the high Andes, this new patio process spread like wildfire through Spanish America. Silver production soared. In the decade to 1590, it was over 1,500 metric tons, making more than 61 million Spanish silver coins of the type called pesos of eight reales, better known in some circles as pieces of eight. 20% of this was owed to the Spanish crown and sailed in convoy twice each year to the royal port at Seville. Spanish coins became the default currency of trade and finance across the world. The Spanish treasury bulged for a time. Almost as quickly, the silver flowed out again to finance the building of the Escorial Palace and numerous cathedrals, to pay for wars against the Ottomans, French, English, Dutch, and Protestants of any stripe, to maintain the colonial administrations, and, not least, to fund artistic and cultural works that made this the golden age of Spain's new empire. But below its golden coat, this golden age was made of silver. And underneath the gilding lurked a few other problems. The money of the Spanish New World was flooding into a Europe still in recovery from the deflationary bullion shortages of the late Middle Ages. Coupled with population growth, the influx of silver caused inflation so rapid, pervasive, and severe that today's economic historians still call it the price revolution. The cost of buying anything rocketed upward throughout Western Europe. The Archbishop of Canterbury preached a sermon against inflation. Governments debased coinage and raised price floors, and even its colonial riches could not stop the Spanish crown from defaulting on its debt. Public unrest soared throughout a Europe racked by inflation. As difficult as inflation made life for everyone in Europe, it was nothing compared to what the population of the Spanish colonies had to endure to produce the silver, especially in the Andes. In Mexico, the population near the ore deposits was thin, and multiple mines had to compete to attract the few workers available. While forced labor had been used early on, by about 1600, Mexican mining had been taken over by a class of free, skilled miners who could and did band together to demand a share of the mine's profits in addition to a daily wage that was high for the time and place. Working conditions were somewhat similar to those in European mines of the same time. By contrast, at Potosí, the Spanish had adopted and intensified an Incan conscription system called the Mita, in which each village had to supply a certain number of laborers for a certain number of days each year to work for free at the direction of the state. Under the Inca, these Mitayos had built roads and fortifications. Under the Spanish, they mined mercury at Juan Cavalica and silver at Potosí, where they toiled beside English privateers captured during attempts to hijack the treasure fleet. Injuries and deaths were routine, and mercury poisoning and pollution were rampant. Spain's silver came at a vast human cost. Economic costs also rose over time as the shafts of Potosí went deeper and the silver grades dropped. Most of the best ores had been located near the surface, and what remained by the late 1560s was leaner, lower grade, and took more work to mine from greater depths. Once mined, it took longer to extract the silver. 
the colder climate of the Andes slowed chemical reactions, so the patio process took six weeks instead of two, as in Mexico. The problem was partly addressed in 1572 when the Viceroy Toledo introduced a series of capital investments and administrative reforms. He had dams built to contain and regulate 20 new artificial lakes, the streams from which powered water wheels that drove stamp mills and hoists. By the early 1600s, the Spanish Empire was at the forefront of mining and metallurgical technology around the world. When a Peruvian metallurgist named Alvaro Barba attempted to publish a technical treatise on the metallurgical methods used at Potosí, the Spanish government suppressed its Madrid publication to prevent copies from giving ideas to competitors all around Europe. But all the technology could not improve one thing, the mercury supply, which was always less than what the silver miners needed. The Spanish government reopened the old Roman mercury mines at Almaden and shipped the product across the Atlantic to Potosí to supplement the mercury supplies from Juan Cavalica. They made a series of attempts to boost production there too, including the world's first known use of gunpowder blasting and mine excavation in 1631. But there was still never enough mercury partly because it was a lucrative crown monopoly under price control set at a level that would benefit the treasury, not encourage production. And there was more competition than ever for the silver. The French, English, and Dutch took advantage of their naval power to seize islands in the Caribbean. These served as the basis for a brisk black market trade in silver and rampant piracy. In 1628, a privateer employed by the Dutch West India Company succeeded in seizing an entire treasure fleet as it left Mexico. The captured money was enough to pay most of a year's worth of expenses for the Dutch army, while also paying the Dutch shareholders a gigantic dividend. Meanwhile, Spain came within inches of sovereign default, despite having produced silver in a quantity the world had never before seen. This buccaneering, privateering, and black marketeering, combined with military overreach and bad mercantile policy, bled the Spanish Empire white over the next century, while their seafaring rivals in northern Europe prospered. By the early 1700s, the Spanish crown was being fought over by the royal families of Austria and France, and the glory days were definitely over. The empire would go on for a while longer, until the weights of the royal silver tax, the royal mercury monopoly, the royal mita service, and other royal exactions at last drove the people of Spanish America to revolution. No longer would treasure fleets bring precious metals across an ocean to Spain. Instead, silver mining became the economic mainstay of the newly independent nations of Peru, Bolivia, and Mexico. Both Spain's golden age and the age of its silver were now in the past.